We'll have the second lecture for the day. Uh, Professor Eric Maloney from Colorado State University will present this. Um, Eric has um, made highly um, influential contributions on various topics related to tropical meteorology observations, modeling, um, and theoretical studies um, of interseasonal variability in the tropics, easterly waves, um, including a lot of work on NGO theory. Um, uh, so some of them that um, Chidong just cited. Eric has also worked on mid-latitude air-sea interaction, regional climate change, uh, tropical and extratropical in interactions. And today's lecture will be on the MJO teleconnections. Eric was the former chair for the Whitney MJO task force and the NOAA MAP um, model diagnostics task force. Um, and yeah, Eric has been involved in many field campaigns as well, uh, such as Dynamo, um, the years of uh, Maritime Continent, and OTREC, uh, a recent field campaign in the East Pacific. Thanks again, Eric, for um, giving our lecture. Okay, let me try to share my screen here. Can you see my screen, Anish? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Let me put this into presentation mode. Um, Thank you uh, very much for the invitation to present at this prestigious colloquium, Anisha and you this. I, I really um, enjoy giving, giving talks and, and meeting all the students and postdocs at these sorts of events. And I was actually an ASP postdoc uh, back in 2000 um, to 2002 and you know, really enjoyed meeting all of the researchers across the country and world at events like this. So, so thank you again. Um, so as uh, Anish mentioned, I am going to talk about uh, tropical meteorology and uh, teleconnections um, during my talk here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more generally about teleconnections, but a lot of my discussion here is actually going to relate uh, to the MJO, um, as the MJO is a major player in S2S prediction across the globe. So just... Um, to point out here, I'm going to cite a lot of references here in this presentation, and I wanted to note, you know, right before I started, that all of the references that I mention are actually included on this page right at the beginning. And so, um, if you see a paper that I cite and you want to go back and take a look at it, um, it's contained within this reference list here. So um, this is part of the presentation, just for your um, reference later on, if you want to look at something. Okay, so what is the problem that we want to look at? And so basically what we want to look at here is the issue of if you have a precipitation anomaly and heating anomaly in the tropical Pacific or Indian Ocean, how does that influence the mid-latitude flow? And this is um, a pattern here that we might call a teleconnection. This is from a famous paper by Harrell and Wallace in uh, 1981. And this is, you know, for example, an El Nino heating anomaly in the Central Pacific. And what you could see in this particular figure is that this El Nino uh, heating anomaly induces a wave train pattern, as we call it, into the higher latitudes consisting of alternating high, low, high, and low geopotential height anomaly centers um, into um, the region over North America. Um, this stationary wave pattern, as many people have alluded to before, can have substantial impacts on weather across the mid-latitudes. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about some of these teleconnection effects on things like atmospheric rivers, droughts, heat waves, cold outbreaks, things like that. But this is the basic topic that we're gonna cover in this lecture. How does this um, particular um, heating anomaly produce a teleconnection pattern like this? And as I mentioned, the MJO is going to be um, a major um, you know, source of this heating. Um, what kind of heating can produce teleconnection patterns? These can actually occur on a variety of timescales. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the MJO here, as uh, Chi Dong you know, mentioned and introduced very nicely in his previous talk. This is a composite life cycle of the MJO produced by Adrian Matthews, where you can see the MJO ticking through each of its eight phases of its life cycle. But teleconnections can actually be induced by a lot of different mechanisms. So El Nino can introduce a teleconnection. Um, and you could also induce teleconnections by shorter timescale heating. There was a very nice paper by Grant Branstetter in 2014 
showing that you know just a two-day pulse-like heating can in induce a teleconnection pattern. So these teleconnection patterns can be in in induced by a variety of things, but I'll make the point that you know the MJO heating structure is actually somewhat optimal for producing teleconnections that have you know, very strong implications for a subseasonal prediction over North America. So to think about this, let's start from the tropical thermodynamic energy balance. And so this is the tropical thermodynamic energy balance put in terms of dry static energy S here. So on the left-hand side, we have um, tendency and advective terms. On the right-hand side, we have a quantity called the apparent heat source that includes things like radiative heating, um, the effect of condensation minus evaporation, and then the effect of um, motions on the subgrid scale, um, eddy, eddy fluxes. Um, I ignore ice here for simplicity, but there's also ice, ice processes that go into this equation as well. So near the equator in the tropics, you can do a, a scale analysis of the um, thermodynamic energy equation and equations of motion that actually simplifies this thermodynamic energy equation quite a bit. So you can actually show that near the tropics, the thermodynamic energy equation is approximated by a balance between Q1, which is the apparent heat source, and adiabatic cooling um, given by omega dSTP on the right-hand side here. So in the tropics, the balance is relatively simple. So what this um, implies is that if you know what an apparent heating is associated with something like the MJO, and you know what the um, stratification of the atmosphere is in terms of how uh, dry static energy changes with height, you could use this to derive a vertical motion out of this you know, dominant thermodynamic energy balance. Um, if you look at what DSTP looks like or the dry static energy um, change with height, you could show that dry static energy increases with height, or in other words, you get a negative DSTP since pressure goes down. And what this implies is that if you know what um, the diabetic heating is and it's positive, you could show that vertical velocity in regions of positive diabetic heating um, has to be upward, um, you know, characterized by a negative omega using this dominant thermodynamic energy balance. Um, so because we're near the equator, um, you get, you know, something called weak temperature um, gradient approximation that can be used to derive the vertical velocity. So people like you know, Qidong actually um, have exploited this dominant balance to derive the vertical motion field and the divergence field if you um, assume a diabetic heating anomaly in the tropics. And so this is actually something in this figure that comes from Qidong's paper with um, Samson Hagos in 2009, where they apply different um, convective heating profiles. Um, this one is a deep convective heating profile shown by the colors here. And the right-hand side is a stratiform heating profile. And what you could show is that you, if you apply, for example, a deep convective heating profile, you get upward motion um, through much of the depth of the troposphere here in the heating region, which is uh, consistent with this equation with divergence in the upper troposphere and convergence in the lower troposphere. Stratiform heating is similar. You get upward motion in the region of positive heating, actually downward motion in the region of negative heating. But you know, even for this profile, you see divergence occurring um, in the upper troposphere. Um, the actual heating profile in MJO convective re in regions, for example, is probably a combination of this deep and stratiform. So if you put these two together, um, you could see that in you know, MJO heating regions, you'll get divergence in the upper troposphere associated with heating. Um, so this is key. So, so you, know, you get divergence aloft um, occurring here. Um, another thing that's really key here is that when you produce divergence in the upper troposphere and divergent winds in the upper troposphere, 
the effect of that doesn't stay in the tropics. And so this is a really nice um, you know, figure from Sardis, Schmuck and Hoskins in 1988 that shows if you put an idealized heating and divergence patch here in the tropical Pacific and look at the divergent wind field that's produced by this heating patch, you could see that the divergent wind field actually has a projection into higher latitudes um, extending out of the tropics. Um, similarly, um, this study um, in 1996 showed the effect on the divergent heating field of a heating anomaly near Darwin, Australia. And you could see that the divergent wind um, extends into higher latitudes away from this heating anomaly. So if you have a heating anomaly in the tropics, again, um, the effect of that isn't you know, just felt locally in terms of local divergence, but it also has a divergent wind component that extends um, into higher latitudes. So why is this important? Um, the reason that this is important is that this extension of divergent wind into higher latitudes can force a Rossby wave source at higher latitudes. And this was nicely shown um, in this study, Slider, Schmuck, and Hoskins, again, 1988. Um, they used a nonlinear vorticity equation, which is shown on the top here. And so on the left-hand side, you have a tendency and evected, evection of absolute vorticity by the rotational wind. So that's what the phi is here um, on, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you have um, two terms. You have a dissipation term F, and you also have a S term here, which is of the Rossby wave source. And breaking out the Rossby wave source, you can see that the Rossby wave source is given by um, V chi here, which is the uh, divergent wind field. So basically you have advection of absolute vorticity by the divergent wind as the first term of the Rossby wave source. And the second term is divergence in the presence of a non-zero absolute vorticity can also generate um, Rossby waves. It turns out that it's this first term, um, advection by the divergent wind field across an absolute vorticity gradient, that is the most important way that a heating anomaly associated with something like the MJO can actually generate a Rossby wave source. If you remember um, in my previous slide, the divergent wind actually extends out into the tropics. And so if this divergent wind experiences a very strong absolute vorticity gradient, um, it can help generate a Rossby wave. So this is where jet streams come in. Um, so this is an analysis that one of my former um, students, uh, Stephanie Henderson, who's now at the University of Wisconsin did. Um, the upper left panel here shows the wintertime mean 250 hectopascal zonal wind in reanalysis data from era interim. And you could see here the presence of a very strong um, seasonal mean North Pacific jet stream occurring in the North Pacific. On, let me see here, let me get a, get a pen out here and see if I could, well, it doesn't look like I get a, could get a pen out here, that's okay. Um, on the south flank of this jet, there's a strong negative um, you know, relative vorticity region. On the northern flank of this jet, there's a relatively strong positive relative vorticity region due to shears of the zonal wind. And so you, have, you actually have a very strong um, positive absolute vorticity gradient across this jet. And so if you have the divergent wind field associated with something like the MJO blowing across this jet, you can generate a very strong Rossby wave source um, according to uh, this equation that I showed down here. Um, the other thing that Stephanie showed is that climate models produce very, very different uh, manifestations of the climatology of the North Pacific. Some models have jets that extend too far east. Some models have jets that um, extend, uh, are, there, are too strong and have too strong of vorticity gradients. Um, so teleconnection biases can you know, um, be generated by the presence of mean state biases in these jets because the Rossby wave source is wrong. Um, I won't talk about that too much here, but just wanted to point that out. Um, so anyways, um, if you have the divergent wind blowing across this jet and the strong uh, absolute vorticity gradients with this jet, 
you can generate Rossby wave sources. And so um, this plot here from one of my other former students, Kai, Qi, Kai Chi Sang, shows Rossby wave sources for one particular phase of the MJO. Um, this phase of the MJO, which we call MJO phase two, is associated with um, positive MJO Indian Ocean convection and a negative um, MJO convective anomaly center over the Western Pacific. It turns out that the divergent wind field associated with this MJO um, heating configuration produces a Rossby wave source that looks like a dipole. And so there's actually a negative Rossby wave source on one flank of the jet here around 180 degrees. And there's a positive Rossby wave source more in the Asian sector, um, you know, caused by Indian Ocean heating over this region. And this sort of Rossby wave source, uh, dipole-like Rossby wave source, is actually very, very effective at producing a teleconnection pattern due to constructive interference. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. And the teleconnection pattern that this Rossby wave source configuration produces looks like this. Um, it's associated with, um, in this case, a suppressed dilution low over the North Pacific low pressure over Alaska, and then higher pressure over the eastern United States. Um, so maybe if I have time, I'll get back to talking about this. But because of the MJO's heating anomaly, it is very effective at producing a Rossby wave source and a teleconnection pattern like that. OK, so I talked a little bit about the Rossby wave source. Um, you also have to think about the pathway that Rossby waves take. Um, there's actually a large body of theory that borrows from um, optics um, and you know indices of refraction and Snell's law, um, basic physics um, to try to explain the pathway of MJO Rossby wave propagation. Um, there's a quantity called stationary wave wave number that's sort of analogous to a refractive index that we can use to explain why um, Rossby waves take the pathways that they do in um, the mid-latitude atmosphere. And this is given by um, essentially the absolute vorticity gradient divided by the mean zonal wind uh, square root. And Stephanie Henderson plotted out the wintertime uh, stationary wave number here that has some very interesting characteristics. You can see that stationary wave number is high in regions of the jet stream. Uh, you can see that it generally increases as you get towards the equator, generally decreases towards the poles. There's a lot of really interesting things that you can do with stationary wave number to think about the pathways that Rossby waves take in the extratropical atmosphere. Um, I won't go into that theory, um, let's see, um, in its entirety right now because it would take up an entire lecture in itself. But there's a really nice paper by Hoskins and Ambrisi in 1993 that talks about um, the pathways that atmospheric Rossby waves take if you know the characteristics of the flow and the stationary wave number uh, distribution in the atmosphere. So for example, on this upper left figure here, you could think about the y-axis being latitude, x-axis being stationary wave number. You can see generally here that stationary wave number in this plot you know, increases as you get towards the equator. You could show, for example, that Rossby wave pathways refract towards regions of higher stationary wave number. So this is a general comment that is true based on this theory. Um, you could also show, for example, if you know what the spatial scale of your disturbance is in terms of a zonal wave number, you could show that all Rossby waves associated with this spatial scale have to refract before they um, reach a latitude where the total stationary wave number is equivalent to that. So you can see that all Rossby waves with certain wave numbers have to bend. You could also look at other things. Um, all Rossby wave numbers at any spatial scale have to refract before the stationary wave number um, reaches um, a value of zero. Um, you could also think about what happens when the stationary wave number goes to infinity. You know, all it gives a possibility that a Rossby waves are absorbed at those latitudes. Um, 
variety of different things you could do with this theory. If you have a jet stream with a maximum and stationary wave number, you could see that, you know, Rossby wave energy is trapped in the jet. So really nice, um, you know, discussion of linear uh, Rossby wave theory in Hoskins and Embrizi 1993 that I actually encourage you to take a look at. Uh, let's skip this for now. Um, so because we have a distribution of um, you know, mean zonal wind um, associated with climatology that has jet streams occurring in certain locations, um, easterly winds on the equator, um, you know, various other characteristics of the mean flow, you could show that preferred teleconnection patterns tend to pop out um, given this background um, basic state wind distribution. Um, Sarge Schmuck and Hoskins talked about this quite a bit. Um, there's other papers that have looked at this, but a preferred teleconnection pattern that tends to pop out is um, something that we're, we refer to as the Pacific North America pattern. And so on this particular plot, um, you could see that if you um, have a heating, for example, that's imposed in the Central Pacific, this tends to produce a wave train associated with one center over the North Pacific, another center over North America, and another center over the Southeastern United States. Um, regardless of where you actually put the heating um, in the tropics, you tend to get a very similar pattern. Um, you see that the magnitude of the pattern may vary depending on where the heating precisely is. And so over the Western Pacific, you can see that heating pattern or the teleconnection pattern is a little bit more muted, um, similar for Eastern Pacific heating. Um, you could also see that there's slight uh, subtle shifts in the teleconnection pattern, depending on where exactly the heating is. And so, for example, you could see here in the Eastern Pacific, the Aleutian low has moved more towards the coast um, than for a Central Pacific heating pattern. Um, these have tangible impacts on teleconnections, which actually complicate things in terms of, for example, being able to um, you know, make S2S predictions of West Coast precipitation, um, but the same general pattern tends to pop out with, with subtle shifts, um, you know, from, you know, in latitude and in longitude and things like that. So certain MJO phases actually have um, really strong and prominent teleconnection patterns. And um, this is a composite life cycle of MJO teleconnection patterns as a function of phase and then lag in time after the phase. And so you could see that um, MJO phases three, two and three, and maybe also six and seven tend to be where teleconnection patterns associated with the MJO are maximized. And the reason is, um, that, that this happens is basically um, because of the reason I told you before in that teleconnection patterns tend to be optimized when you have more of a dipole heating structure associated with the MJO and a dipole Rossby wave source structure associated with the MJO on the equator. So I showed before that MJO phases two and three tend to produce a dipole-like heating structure and a dipole-like Rossby wave source that produces a very strong teleconnection pattern. The opposite phases would also be true if you looked at MGO phases six and seven, it would also tend to produce um, a dipole-like um, heating source uh, and Rossby wave source of the opposite sign that would also um, tend to produce a very strong teleconnection pattern. So this is sort of an optimal configuration um, as far as you know, MJO forcing the extra tropics. And we've you know, quantified this also in this plot, which I won't get to in any um, you know, more detail here, but just to point out that we looked at this in more detail in this paper by my former student Kai, Kai Chi Sang in 2019. Okay, so Anish, how much more time do I have here? Maybe about three minutes, Eric, and then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay, sounds good. Um, why do we care about this teleconnections? This is something I'll skip and we'll get into too much more detail, but these teleconnection patterns modulate tangible weather on places like the West Coast. So for example, you can show that atmospheric rivers along the West Coast are um, preferentially uh, modulated by the MJO uh, because of these teleconnection patterns that occur. 
There's a lot of complications with this and that QBO phases also matter, but um, there's a lot of uh, potential for prediction, um, you know, based on um, the fact that there are these relationships between the MJO and teleconnections. Okay, so last thing I'll talk about here is the topic of how these teleconnections might change in the future. So remember that heating in the tropics is balanced by vertical velocity based on this equation here. Um, in a future warmer climate, um, one very robust prediction about the tropics is that the tropics are going to preferentially warm in the upper troposphere. And this is shown um, in the study here that I did with Angel Adamas and uh, my former postdoc, Heen Bui. And we showed that in RCP 8.5 um, scenario, you know, climate model simulations, there's a very robust warming of the tropical upper troposphere. And this actually increases the magnitude of the vertical dry static energy gradient in the upper troposphere. And a prediction from this balance is that a weaker vertical velocity is needed to balance a diabatic heating in the tropics. So if you have a weaker vertical velocity, um, you know, per unit MJO heating, for example, this is likely to weaken MJO teleconnections in a future warmer climate. And is this true? Um, is, is, does this actually occur? And we've actually done some work to look at that, you know, with my former students, uh, Brandon Wolding and Stephanie Henderson, and we took a state-of-the-art climate model called the superparameterized CESM, ran it in current climate and ran it in four times CO2 world and looked at the strength of the MJO teleconnection. And what we showed is that indeed, because of the um, increase in tropical static stability and weakening of vertical circulations with the MJO, we actually got a weaker um, teleconnection associated with the MJO in a future warmer climate. Um, this compares two phases here, and you could see um, the weaker North Pacific teleconnection. And we did a scale analysis of the response, and it definitely does scale with uh, changes in tropical static stability. The complication here is that there are other things going on as well. So in this particular plot, you could actually see that, yes, the response is weakened, but the teleconnection response actually shifts eastward. And so um, that might actually increase the effect of the MGO teleconnection on the west coast of the United States, even though you get a weaker teleconnection pattern. Um, this was actually highlighted in this recent paper in 2020, showing that the effect of an eastward shift to teleconnection does increase the impact of the MGO on California precipitation, for example. Um, study by Joe et al. 2020. And I think this issue um, was actually brought out really nicely in this particular paper by um, a former student of Elizabeth Barnes and Dave Randall at CSU, where they looked at mechanisms driving the MGO teleconnection with warming and CMIP6 models. Um, they make the point that the MGO teleconnection is sensitive to a number of factors, including the mean state dry static energy change, which I highlighted but it's also dependent on the mean flow and um, the propagation and intensity characteristics of the MJO itself. Um, and so this paper shows that um, decreases in MJO teleconnections uh, due to um, tropical dry static energy uh, changes are robust, but there's a lot of uncertainty created due to mean state winds changing in a future warmer climate um, that produces a lot of uncertainty in you know, future MJO teleconnections. So their um, grand conclusion here is that um, you may get a reduction in a, a boreal winter MGO teleconnections across most CMIP-6 models, but um, there's a lot of nuance over North America due to um, eastward expansion of the MGO's teleconnection due to jet streams shifting and things like that. So a lot of future work that needs to be done on this particular problem. Okay. Um, let me just uh, leave some key questions up here for possible discussion. So there's a lot of interesting questions here about how will the MGO change in the future that we have not addressed yet. 
Um, how will tropical teleconnections associated with the MJO change in the future warmer climate? Um, this is dependent not only on how the MJO changes, but also mean state wind changes that add complications to things. Um, and then you have to worry about what the implications are for mid-latitude S2S prediction, you know, based on changes in teleconnection. So a um, lot of interesting stuff there to study. Um, and then more basically, I think, um, you know, how can we fully explain our current knowledge about teleconnections for uh, S2S uh, mid-latitude prediction? Um, this is something that um, I think machine learning and techniques and things like that that we'll learn later in the week are going to um, you know, bring a lot to bear in terms of improving our prediction skill for California precipitation, for example. Um, so with that, I think I'll wrap up here and um, hopefully I've left some time for questions. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. It was an excellent summary of a lot of work. Mm -hmm.